Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special episode of Talk at Nets. Yes, we're coming to you in the offseason. Yes, the NBA is over. Yes, we're all still coming off the high of the bubble and the Lakers winning that chip to tie the Celtics. But it's a big episode for Talk at Nets. We love round numbers here. We're on episode 60. But we're coming around to some big anniversaries. We're closing in on almost exactly one year from when Keith and I really got going on Talking Nets. When this releases, it'll be the day before the one-year anniversary of the Nets season opener last year. If everything had gone to plan, we would be you know, at the stadium, ready to go, doing our last Nets preview before the season starts. But here we are. We're living in coronavirus 2020, but we're still making it work. What's up, Keith? Yo, Hudson, what's up, bro? Uh, yeah, crazy. Been about a year. I sent you that tweet from about a year ago today with talking Jake, talking about talking Knicks, and uh, me responding about the Nets, and then talking Nets getting started. But yeah, you mentioned you know this year, uh, 2020, and what we would have been doing or what we thought we were going to be doing with this pod, with this show. Um, it's crazy to think about for me personally. The first podcast I ever did, I did 30 episodes and it was one Yankee season. And I thought that was a lot. We've doubled that here on Talking Nets. We've done 60 episodes as of today, as of right now. Uh, Pinstripe Strong, I think I've, I don't know how many episodes I, I don't know how many episodes I've done of that. Uh, there's one after every Yankee series and we, we've done a bunch, probably close to 60 that I've been on, maybe more. Um, but man, the journey from a year ago, I wasn't working with John Boy Media. I wasn't working with John Boy. I just was like a fan and a friend on Yankees Twitter. And then, you know, I, I mentioned to Jake, because Jake was after the season, after the Yankees lost last year, he was like, hey, you know, if you're down about the Yankees, like, let's talk about the Knicks. Here's, here's the new episode of Talking Knicks. And I, I replied, I said, but we're Nets fans. And then he replied and he said, we're working on Talking Nets. And from there, I just had the inside angle to reach out to John Boy, reach out to Jake and say, yo, what's up with that? And then after we talked for a little while, it was like, hey, we actually need a guy to kind of spearhead this thing and, uh, you know, jump on the podcast. And it was really nothing. And, and Jimmy told me straight up, like all of the properties under John Boy Media, the podcast network, whatever, it's a situation where you come in. You create it, you make it, and whatever you make it is what it's going to be. It's not going to be John Boy helping you out. It's not going to be Jake helping you out. It's going to be whatever you make it. And for us last year, around this time, in the beginning of the season, when the Nets were in China playing the Lakers, and then they came back, and Kyrie had broke his face, and, you know, we're thinking about this team, and we had the media day where we see KD and Kyrie in the jerseys for the first time. Um, you know, Hudson was just an intern. And I remember not even, I had no clue who Hudson was, but I got his number and, you know, he was doing a couple things. I think you went to the Barclays Center for a game. Was it the Hornets game? No, nah, that was opening night. It was opening night against the So you were at opening night. Yeah, I remember now. So tell us about that. Like, and I was, I remember telling you, yo, cover whatever you can cover for Instagram, Twitter, whatever pictures, videos you can get. Yeah, absolutely. And it's crazy to think that that was, almost exactly a year ago watching Kyrie make his debut drop 50 lose in overtime thinking about Jared Allen breaking two free throws at the end of that game <laughs> should have won that game feels like ancient history now I think you know it's crazy just to even think that far back and to think that we you know we've done 60 of these episodes and that's 60 episodes on a schedule that we created we didn't know how things were going to go things you know tapered off at some time some things you know got going again at some times even during the shutdown we were like all right how often are we going to do this are we going to do it once a week twice a week are we going to keep the schedule we were on but we kept it going and we made it through we made it through the bubble playoffs we watched the nets get swept and now we're on to 2021 but it almost doesn't feel like that and it's just crazy to to think back for for me myself keith talks about how he had the inside track <laughs> i had the outside track keith was all on Twitter. Keith had the connections. Uh, I had a burner account and not much <laughs> else other than that. 
Yeah. I, I, I reached out as a burner account. I had, you know, the white orb was my, my logo. I was one of those anonymous people that me and Keith always complain about. <laughs> But I reached out, I got it done. And, you know, obviously, I got brought on as an intern. And then some things happened. And I became, you know, the full time co host after some some searching there on Keith's end. And it's just crazy to think that it's been all this time, it's been a year. But it's been a year and we still don't have uh, have NBA to, th- to think about for another little while. <laughs> Yeah, man. It's it's just all crazy to think about. I mean, if I just go back to what was going through my mind when this happened a year ago, I had no idea. I actually, uh, I was going to Boston with some of my friends, and I didn't expect to get DM'd back, actually. And then I got the DM shot back to me, and they said, hey, uh, we're, we have some, some ideas for a Talking Nets logo. You, you know how to do Photoshop? And I was <laughs> like, yeah, I know how to do Photoshop. And now, you know, 60 episodes later, we got the logo that I created before I even did any social media or did any of that stuff. Hudson made the logo. I did not know that you made the logo until like a month ago, two months ago. It's so funny. I remember you asked me about that. You had no idea. And it's funny. I was looking on my computer and I had some of my initial mock-ups for what I was like, what what am I going to make the logo look like? And damn, I'm glad I went with the current one because some of those mock-ups were garbage. But it's just crazy to think that, you know, all this time later, and here we are, it's a fully fledged podcast. We had some some good times. We had some times where we didn't know if things were going to continue. We even had some times where Keith did the podcast on his own. Yeah. Yeah, bro. I, I here we are. I remember you saying to me, should I make an account with my name and I'm like yeah I'm such a huge proponent for like just be on the internet as yourself uh I remember you asking like hey should I make an account and that was when I first started thinking about like yeah dude if you're with us and you're running with us make an account with your name and I think it was like episode maybe eight probably under that maybe like episode five where I was like hey you want to do an episode with me you want to try and do an episode and I don't think you realize, but it was a trial run. We had a few different people on and, uh, you know, shout out to Billy, shout out to Dane. Uh, I forget who else I had on. And I talked to some people, but it it was like, for me, the decision came down to like a couple things. You know, if I need to pick a co-host for Talking Nets, it it needs to be someone that has the time for this. It can't be someone with a full-time job. It can't be someone who isn't fully committed or, I don't know. And it just felt right, man. The way that the universe works and the way that things line up, you got to kind of trust your gut and go at your gut feeling. And I had a gut feeling after the first podcast Hudson and I did where he just stepped in because I was doing podcasts on my own where I was like, this isn't going to flow right with me just talking by myself. And once we got this thing off the ground with a couple episodes, me and another co-host and the other co-host um, went on to do other things. This wasn't a priority for him. I couldn't let this thing fail. I couldn't let this thing fall. And I looked at it also as like a test. This is like I said, this is before I started working for John Boy full time. I met with John Boy when he first moved to um, when he first moved to New York. When John Boy first came to Harlem, I met with him and we talked about talking nets. And I had already had a talking nets hoodie made that I made for the I'm going with Brooklyn commercial. So, you know, we're talking about talking nets and my ideas and plans for it. I'm telling them that I'm connected with the Yes Network. I'm telling them the New Jersey ties and when I started rooting for the Nets and what I see for the, you know, the Nets fan base and and uh, you know, talking nets brand and uh Hudson was was great as intern, elevated intern into host. And here we are 60 episodes later and it's like you know, you talked about um, things we went through. We went through the coronavirus stoppage where at John Boy Media, we didn't even know how we were going to go about our podcast. We were like, do we take a break right now? There's a, there's a pandemic. Then there was racial issues and, and protest and violence and killings. There's like so many things. Um, I mean, to kick the year off, we lost Kobe. And that was hard on every basketball fan, sports fan. And we had to come together and do a pod speaking on Kobe and his legacy 
And that was big for myself and Hudson because for the whole John Boy Media brand, people were looking at John Boy Media like, how come you guys didn't say anything about the passing of Kobe Bryant, Gianna Bryant? And I'm like, well, we're not reporters. We don't do news. But at the time, I felt like Talking Nets had a lane to speak in basketball terms, in fan, basketball fan terms, and we did. So that's cool. And uh, we won't bore you too much with uh, more of us reminiscing, but I feel like people listening to Talking Nets right now might not have been there in the beginning. And it's always good to have that context. It's always good to get to know the host and get to know the backstory and feel like you're a part of it. Um, it's the off season. In the off season, I think you'll get to learn more about Hudson and I just because we don't have as much basketball to talk about, but we are going to talk about some NBA news today. And Hudson Flynn is going to take the A mic. He's going to lead us through the episode. So handing it right over, Hudson, do your thing. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's, we're, we're into the NBA summer, even though it's the NBA fall, 70 degrees outside feels like summer. And we're getting our first real movements in the news. We have movement on the fronts of New Orleans with Stan Van Gundy getting the job. One of the Van Gundys finally left the booth, left ESPN, and now they're going to be working on the sidelines for New Orleans. And I'll let you talk about it, Keith, but my first thought was, where's Kenny? Yeah, well, where's our guy? <laughs> my first thought is, damn. Uh, you know, as a Nets fan, obviously, I'm not always, you know, going to root for other teams. I was uh, actually kind of happy when the Knicks didn't get Kenny because Kenny would have been the perfect person to actually turn that trash heap of a franchise around. But now that Kenny didn't get the New Orleans job, and that was a job that I really thought he'd excel at with all of the pieces they have, all of, you know, the future assets. I thought he'd excel there, but he didn't get it. And obviously, it goes to another deserving candidate in Stan Van Gundy. It, you know, a lot of people were surprised that he hadn't gotten a job up until this point. But I'm, I'm wondering where, is, where Kenny's going to land. And, I'm, Keith, I'll let you get your, your thoughts in on this. But, man, I'm just like, this man is too good of an NBA coach to not be a head coach. But every day that passes, it looks like he might not be. Oh, my God, they killed Kenny. They killed Kenny's career. Kenny, once again, doesn't get to coach the stars. <laughs> like, he has opportunities to land – and go coach some superstars. I would have loved to see him get a chance to coach Zion Williamson, but hey, they plucked the guy out of the TV ranks. They plucked the guy out of the TV booth, out of the broadcast. Um, we, we've heard a bunch of games with Stan, Stan Van Gundy. We've heard great analysis coming from a former head coach. Just the Van Gundy name has that pedigree. And uh, I mean, good for him, but yeah, it sucks for Kenny. And I think this was a type of thing where like, they, you know, once again, the NBA is a business and these – Teams are companies and their businesses, and they know their guy. Like, they know who they want or they know who they're targeting. I saw a report that there was, like, three other guys in the mix for this job, and Ty Lu was one of them. Um, but I just think it was, like, this organization probably wanted Stan Van Gundy to lead them. There's that viral video of Alvin Gentry drawing up a play, and J.J. Reddick kind of gives um, Lonzo Ball a look like, like what? And Lonzo Ball looks up like they both looked up like, nah, that shouldn't be the play. So um, what's the name of what's the name of the the Pelicans GM? Damn, you got you you stumped me. My Pelicans trivia is not is not with it. Trajan Langdon. I not uh, Trajan. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about Trajan Langdon. I know I know the Alaskan ass assassin from Duke. Uh I don't even know who I'm thinking of, and I don't want to leave too much dead air on the pod. Oh, David Griffin. David Griffin is who I'm thinking of. And if I had time to research, there's probably some type of connection between David Griffin and uh, Stan Van Gundy. So congrats to Stan Van Gundy. Congrats to Zion, B.I., So, Josh Hart, all those guys down there. Uh, Hayes, like, hopefully this is the guy that, you know, can get them in the playoffs next year. We need to see Zion in the playoffs. We might see some some interesting matchups in the playoffs, and we might see some some throwbacks to the uh, the what was it the 2012 Super Bowl when we had the Harbaugh's going up against each other 2013 maybe because 20, 2012 we got, in yeah 2012. 2012 was the 2012 was the Giants so it was either 2011 or 2013 but it, we got it some 20, some other Van Gundy news. 2012 season 
Yeah, it was. And yeah, then it, it finishes in um, 2013. 2013. I That's remember that, was. though, because yep, that, yep. uh, that was in New Orleans. It was Niners versus Ravens, Kaepernick's Niners. And uh, the that lights the went power out. Outage came. Yeah, the lights yeah. went out at half. But we got, some, we got some more, some familial ties. We got Jeff Van Gundy being rumored to get the Rockets job. And to me, that's more of an interesting job. That's more of a job that I could see one of the Van Gundys picking up more so than the Pelicans job because the Pelicans to me still seem more like a developmental task more so than the Rockets. And the Rockets ownership uh, have, has come out and said, we are keeping the core together. We're still going to rock with uh, James Harden and Russell Westbrook, which not a decision that I would have gone with, but there's a reason that they're an owner and I'm not. And Keith, I'll let you speak more on it. But what do you think about you know, going with Van Gundy, keeping the core together and not mixing things up going into the future for a team that really hasn't been able to have that, that type of playoff success? No, nah, I don't think this is going to be good, man. Uh, the Rockets, they lose again in the, in the postseason. They get rid of Daryl Morey. They get rid of Mike D'Antoni. They're rumoring Jeff Van Gundy's pretty much got that job. There's so many rumors that now the rumor is Mike Miller is supposed to join him on the Rockets staff. It hasn't been announced that he's landed this job, but I think this is just the Rockets playing it safe right now going with a, a, a safe name that everyone in basketball knows, a coach also with experience that we know is trying to get back into the NBA. And here's a question for you, because I don't really care to talk too much more about this. Stan Van Gundy, Jeff Van Gundy, two guys that were on TV broadcast, right? They get jobs, and we're assuming that Jeff is getting the Rockets job. They get jobs. How come no one is screaming about Mark Jackson right now? How come no one's playing the black card for Mark Jackson? How come no one's saying, hey, there's another guy on TV that's been great for years and he's black. Give him a shot. And I'm not the one to do that because, like I said, on this pod already, and I've said in past podcasts, it's a business. These guys know who they want, black, white, or whatever. Like, they know who their guy is. I feel like the Rockets knew who their guy potentially was in this situation. They're playing it safe. They got rid of Daryl Morey, who – said some nice things about James Harden changing the game. He had a full spread in, I guess, the Houston Chronicle. I don't know the paper out there. He had a full spread in the paper basically to shout out James Harden and the organization and how much it changed his life. And we all know his downfall was what he tweeted out and what he said against China last year. Fast forward to where we are now. And that relationship got repaired through the coronavirus, who would have thought, and the NBA Finals. But – um yeah, I think this is just a safe play for the Rockets, and I'm kind of curious as to why so many people had something to say about the, the Nets hiring Steve Nash, but nobody has anything to say about Jeff Van Gundy and Stan Van Gundy getting hired over Mark Jackson. Is it because they have experience and Steve Nash doesn't? Well, I'll let that segue right into the next piece that I just tossed in there. I almost forgot to put it in the notes is the Pacers hiring Nate Bjorkgren. And damn, you're talking about black people and white people. I don't know a whiter name than Nate Bjorkgren. He was an uh, assistant on the Toronto Raptors. Obviously a great staff. Nick Nurse knows how to develop a team. He knows how to develop a staff. He gets hired and it's another job that Mark Jackson didn't get hired to. And I don't know. I don't know why the Nets caught this kind of attention. And a lot of these other people aren't. Obviously, they're more well-known commodities in the coaching world than Steve Nash is. But to me, I think it's just because the Nets have the spotlight on them. No one really cares what's going on in Indy. No one really cares. Even if Zion's there, they only care about what Zion and Lonzo are doing. It's New York. It's New York. It's that spotlight. And the Nets are the New York franchise. Look at all of the things that are going on in New York sports right now. There's not much else other than the Nets. The Rangers had the first overall pick. Obviously, the Islanders played well in the playoffs. The Yankees just got eliminated. The Mets are nothing to be excited about. The Giants and the Jets are the worst two franchises of football I've ever seen play. It's the Nets, and the Nets have the sole focus of the New York media cycle. And 
of course they're going to catch flack because they could have caught flack for any hire. They could have made, you know, what some saw as the safe hire in Ty Lu, And people would be like, wait, but is it going to work out with him and Kyrie again? And it just, it's just a matter of the Nets having these polarizing players and being the number one market in New York, you know, in New York City, the number one thing, biggest media market in the world, all eyes on the borough of Brooklyn. And for me, that's something I like. I like that Nets focus. You used to have to go to, you know, the back page of the paper to, to find any type of news about the Nets. It was deep. No one was talking about the Nets because why would they? Yeah. But now they are. And honestly, although it, you know, it sucks that Net, the Nets caught some flack there, I like it. I like that the Nets are getting that attention. And I'll let you take it away. But to me, it's just an overall sign of the positive movement that the Nets are having. It's a sign of the times. It comes with the territory. And uh, I'm cool with it. I understand it. I get it. Market one. New York, New York. Right now, New York is looking for a hero. I need a hero. Like, New York is looking for a champion. New York is looking for a team to bring it home. I had a conversation with one of my homies the other day about, like, yo, how would you feel if the Nets have a championship parade in New York before the Yankees? And I was like, I'd be cool with it. I'd be super cool with it. I would be there. I'd be at that. And, uh, you know, going back to this hire and talking about how people were screaming about Steve Nash and playing the race card there. I think it was just because of the way that the Nets did it. Nobody knew about it. I saw something this week that Karras and Spencer didn't even know it was going down until it got announced. And the Nets announced it while the bubble was still going on, while the playoffs were happening. This guy uh, that the Pacers hired, he's a career G League coach. And I don't know, I, I saw that he's like uh, a former assistant to Nick, Nick Nurse. So maybe they're thinking he's going to have some of that Nick Nurse magic, but how come nobody's talking about that? Mark Jackson played for the Pacers. The Pacers didn't want to hire him, take him out of the booth. We just seen two guys come out of the booth, assuming that Jeff Van Gundy gets the rocket job and uh, the Pelicans job goes to his brother. Come on, man. Keep the same energy out there. That's all I'm, I'm asking for is for y'all to keep the same energy. Back to you, Hudson. No, absolutely. You got to keep the, sh the, the same energy. I almost just slipped and said the sheen energy because our next news <laughs> is Duncan Robinson getting called out like sheen from Jimmy Neutron all throughout the bubble. <laughs> God damn, I just put a photo of sheen in the notes so that Keith can get a, a point of reference here. No, I know exactly. <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's good. I didn't know if that was only my childhood, but damn, I see it. I see it. I see it. And, you know, you know, there's always going to be trash talk going back and forth. People talk about MJ being the goat. Part of that is because of his trash talk. I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say. If I would have to go through every day of my life knowing that I have the wettest three-point release in the NBA but everyone's clowning me for looking like Sheen from Jimmy Neutron. Man, Duncan Robinson has actually become a player that is very interesting that I rooted for this year. Uh, between the story about him at Michigan and, you know, that text message that went viral of him basically looking for a job, thinking that he wasn't going to be able to land a job in the NBA, then his grind and his hustle to get to, you know, a team in the finals and being a starter. When I saw this Jimmy Neutron stuff, it cracked me up. And I, I like, I, I remember New, Jimmy Neutron being introduced on Nickelodeon as like the new wave of Nickel, Nickelodeon. And of course, I know he, they weren't calling him Jimmy Neutron because he looks like Jimmy. They were calling him that because he looks like Sheen. Big face ass Sheen. <laughs> Yo, it just shows you the NBA is ruthless. The trash talk can go anywhere. And these players, they got no respect for you. They're, they're going to call you anything to get you off your game so that you don't hit those shots that literally they're telling you to shoot it every time you get it. So, yeah, that's, like that, that's funny, man. I like it. <laughs> I think it's definitely a funnier trash talk related headline than who was it? Was it was it Montrez Harrell called Luca bitch ass white boy? Like, that, yeah, that's that's, that's, a, that's a better. That's a that's a that's weak. I like Sheen. I think, you know, I played hockey and chirping is a big part of hockey. That's a good one. That, that one's good. I, I absolutely co-sign that. Whoever came up with that in the Lakers locker room, 
I am absolutely, absolutely on board with Kyle I hope Kuzma. I hope it was JR. I hope it was JR. <laughs> who else would it be, right? That's some, JR. that's some burn shit JR would think of. Like, yo, you know who that boy looked like over there? Jimmy Neutron. And then Kuz is like, nah, not Jimmy, it's she. <laughs> <laughs> you knew Kuz had to get in there. You knew <laughs> Oh man, it, it's it's tough. It's tough. You put me on a mic, and now I'm in a position where I have to segue to that from that to some more serious topics, where we had some of you know the stars of today's game, Donovan Mitchell, C.J. McCollum, and Tobias Harris, go out and talk with uh, Vice Presidential Candidate Kamala Harris on issues relating to the Black community. They put out a video. All four of them were together in like an airplane hangar. And they talked about a lot of different things, things that were impacting their community, things that were that, you know, Kamala thought that she could do to benefit that community. And to me, that looks just like another step that NBA players are taking to use the platform that they've been given because of their natural ability to make some change. I don't think we see this, even with, you know, a candidate like Barack Obama back in 2008. He's a huge basketball fan, huge Bulls fan, huge Duke fan. He wasn't having, you know, Kobe, LeBron come on to his campaign and talk about what he's going on. And I think that just shows how polarizing things are right now. But to me, it's a great step for these players to to find their voices and to show that they do have a voice and they shouldn't, you know, just shut up and dribble because of their job. But I'll let you take it away because obviously you've had a lot to say on issues related to this kind of a thing. Yeah, I have, and, I, and I've kind of cooled off on it. Um, I've kind of, I won't say f- fallen back on it, but I've kind of chilled a little bit because you can't fight everybody, and you damn sure can't fight everybody online. And uh, I, I spoke out enough this year where I think people understand where I'm at, and uh, I appreciate these players speaking out so that people can understand where they're at. When you look at C.J. McCollum, Donovan Min- uh, Mitchell, Tobias Harris, these are three guys – that we know are involved with things outside of basketball, bigger than basketball. CJ McCollum, um, being a communications graduate from Lehigh, you know about his podcast. I just heard he's launching another show. A uh, smart guy that, you know, he's not just a basketball player. Donovan Mitchell going to school at Louisville. We saw how much he did to say her name, Brianna Taylor, how much he did uh, this whole year speaking out, even with COVID. People forget now when, uh, COVID hit the NBA, it was Gobert, it was Donovan. There was people really worried about those two. And Donovan Mitchell came on Good Morning America and was like one of the first NBA players to speak. Like, yeah, I had it. This thing is real. This, that, and the other. And Tobias Harris is another guy. I'm pretty sure he's, he's into like a vegan lifestyle. He's got some other things off the court that um, he's into. So for those three guys to speak with Kamala Harris, I think it's great. If you don't know who Kamala Harris is, she will be potentially our vice president. She is running with Joe Biden. Uh, I'm not going to speak too much on it because, like I said, I, I kind of have taken a step back. I think I've said enough, and I think people feel me. Obviously, fuck Donald Trump. Like, that's regular FDT. Like, I don't even have to tell you why. There's literally 3,000 reasons why. Um, and it's, it's time. We're getting closer to the election a couple weeks now. If you're listening to this podcast and you're not registered, to vote you're wild goofy for that like I don't even get that unless you're under the age to vote well that's different but if you're a grown man and you're listening to this pod and you're not voting shame on you um it's it's that big it's it's that it's that big it's that serious and uh this country needs to change this country uh it it needs to move forward and let's say our president gets reelected. it's still gonna be there's still gonna be some changes there's still gonna be some change but let's say our president doesn't get reelected and we have a new president and vice president in office. I see even more change happening. And this whole year is the year of change, 2020. To get to that better future, you got to go through the, the hard present. You got to go through the tough times and you got to change the little things that we've been living with that we know are wrong, the little things that we've been living with that we know we could do better. And I love that these NBA players are never going to shut up and dribble like the shut up and dribble thing from LeBron a couple years back with uh, I can't remember her name and I don't even care to give her the light, but that angle, that like Republican angle, that right angle, which like sometimes low key comes off as racist. You know, when that lady told LeBron to shut up and dribble, you know, that sparked the whole movement more than an athlete and stuff like this. And 
a lot of people might not know Kamala Harris, but they will tune in to something like this when they see the name CJ McCollum, Donovan Mitchell, Tobias Harris. So more power to those guys uh, using their platforms and doing things like this for this country uh, that don't include layups and assists and free throws. So keep it up, fellas. It's a real issue, though. They can't shut up and dribble. And we see the reason why when we see people like Marcus Smart, obviously player for the Celtics, he was lighting it up from three, always kind of known to be more of a gritty guy, but he really you know, got his shine during the playoffs. He comes out with a Players Tribune article talking about racial justice, and the article itself is titled, This Article Is Not About Basketball, which just right off the bat, right off the top, you know, sets it up to be, all right, this is what, this is what's up. This is what's going on. And in the article, he talks about how he had an interaction with a fan and he's had some interactions with fans in Boston and Boston sports as a whole have had some issues with things like this. Obviously we saw, you know, issues with the Red Sox coming out when they said they supported Black Lives Matter. And he, he had an incident with a fan where she said, and I'm not going to read, you know, the real quote, because first off, I can't. But, you know, she said, you know, F you, F you, you fucking N word. And, you know, it's real. It's real. And these are the people that they came to see. This was a fan in the stadium. And what, what have we come to as a society when we expect NBA players to sit there and just take that abuse and not do anything about it and not say anything about it and not try to make the change that they know they have to make when they feel the effects of, you know, the issues in this country. And I know, you know, Keith, you said you didn't want to get into it too much more and we'll hop out of it pretty soon. But to me, I think that's just, you know, another sign that that shows there's a right side of these things to be on and there's a wrong side of these things to be on. And if you're on the side where, you know, you think that these players should just have to, you know, play the game and take this abuse just because they're athletes, just because they make money, you're on the wrong side. Yeah. Just because these guys have money, athletic ability, they, they're not immune to this. Uh, no black person is immune to this. Uh, I would dare to say that most black people over a certain age have similar stories to this story that Marcus Smart shared. And it's crazy when you visualize it, right? You try and picture an arena, Boston Garden, TD Garden. What kind of car do you think this guy was in? What, what kind of car do you think Marcus Smart was driving? A nice car. And uh, <laughs> Kanye had a line. He said, uh, even if you're in a Benz, you're still an N-word in a coupe. Like, they didn't need to see. This lady did not need to see what kind of car you were in. He even said that she was wearing an Isaiah Thomas Celtics jersey. She didn't need to recognize whether you were a player or not. She heard your voice. She saw you. And the first thing that she thought to do was to call you the N-word. Now, what's crazy is I see some people online saying that this story didn't happen, calling cap on him. Like, why would he make this up? Why would he, why would he share this story? There's no cool points in this. There's nothing that we gain from sharing these stories. Like, through this year... I have realized there's so many little stories and things that happened to me that are suppressed memories that I forgot about. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> a guy like Marcus Smart to come out and talk about this and to talk about his experience with the coronavirus this year, him being the only player to test positive, man, it's been a rough year, a rough year for Americans, a rough year for the whole country, but specifically Americans and more specifically African-Americans. The coronavirus hit the African-American community hard. And then a lot of us were faced with uh, having to have some tough conversations this year. White people, too. Other nationalities, too. But, man, 2020 was really – it's still going on. It's really a year of uh, just a lot of crazy stuff. And, yeah, I don't, I don't want to talk about it too much, but I have no problem speaking on it because this is my reality, too, as a black male. This is my reality, too, as someone that has worked hard, has achieved things, but still could be reduced – to a word could still be disrespected and treated as nothing because of my skin color. And it's, uh, it's foul. It's unfortunate. And, you know, we talked about the little kid, you know, this woman spewing hate was uh, holding her son's hand, a little boy. And he also spoke about how racism is taught. It is passed down. I saw the NFL when the NFL started, they came out with, you know, in bold letters, 
and racism. And I kind of thought about it. I think I said something on one of my sportscaster streams. I'm like, that's a bold statement. That's a lofty request. Because to end racism, it would start in the homes. And what these people do and teach in private, man, you, you can't stop that. So, I mean, it takes, you know, it takes all of us. It's little by little going to change. My grandmother's 76. And, you know, some, some younger black people say, no, I don't see change. Now, my grandmother, I have conversations with her. I actually need to call her. Uh, and she says, no, I have seen change. She tells me stories about walking to school because there was no bus for her in her area. And, uh, you know, kids throwing stuff at her as she was walking to school. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that being fine, right? Like kids throwing stuff on the bus while my grandmother's walking to school and, you know, in her area, uh, you know, segregation, stuff like that. Like we've come a long way, but there's a lot longer to go. And I'm glad that these athletes with their platforms, with their money and their success and all that aren't acting like they never dealt with this stuff because we all do. So, yeah, it takes, it takes all of us. It absolutely takes every single person. It takes the players. It takes the league. It certainly shined a light on, you know, the opportunity the league had to, to make change, to amplify these players' voices. I think that is something that's very important. It's great to see that the NBA as the league that we're a fan of is the league that we follow we don't have to disavow the actions of the league just so that we can like watching our team play. And the league continues doing things. They do, they, they've made real change. They've donated real money. They've you know, created real foundations, but they're also doing some symbolic work. They're making some symbolic changes. And one of them is, you know, you know considering when they should make the first game of next season. And currently the target date is actually Martin Luther King day. And aside from that being, you know, a great, a great time in the NBA, obviously the NBA always has a lot of great work with MLK Day. Obviously it would be really cool to see opening day games happen on MLK Day. It's also great to see that the NBA has a solidified target date and a time that they are working to. And when the NBA puts out targets, they hit them. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Keith, I'll let you talk about it, but it's a while from now. We're sitting here in October months away from that we got the whole offseason the draft free agency the nets making every single trade in the book ahead of us but we have a target date and we have a day to look forward to yeah uh i know somebody's probably listening to this podcast right now and saying like yo didn't keith say that a couple months ago a couple months ago i'm pretty sure i said that the nba was looking to return in mid-january um i actually went to the game this past year on mlk day uh who do we play Sixers came to town to face the Nets without Joel Joel Embiid and uh Ben Simmons had a ridiculous triple double I think he had like 34 points like 15 boards and another like 12 assists or rebound who knows um shout out to Mr. Burn notice my guy John we uh we had great seats um hooked up by John but that like you said that date is always celebrated by the NBA and for the NBA to take the stances they did, literally start the bubble, shut the bubble down when things were going wild in Kenosha, um, Black Lives Matter on the court, uh, so many things that the NBA has done in that vein, it would make a lot of sense to try and target MLK Day as the restart of the NBA, hopefully back in the arenas with whatever guidelines and things uh, you know, need to happen. Um, I think the NBA tries to make it happen. If that's what they want to do, there's nothing stopping them besides themselves. And we'll see how this world is going or how this country is going. But for the most part, I think uh, it's going to happen. So I'm looking forward to Martin Luther King Day 2021 and the NBA coming back. And here's another thing I said to Hudson before we started recording. I'm like, bro, I want to hit the ground running right after New Year's. Talking Nets, talking Nets fam. If we can get back in the Barclays Center, if we can get tickets, we will be at games, we will be doing meetups, we will doing, be doing things in real life, not on Zoom, not on podcasts, not on Instagram, not on Twitter, like real Nets fans linking up. And uh, if you're one of those real Nets fans and you want to get down with the team, reach out, hit us up, wherever. You can hit Hudson up, you can hit me up, you can hit us up at Talking Nets, you can hit John Boy Media up. Um, if you want to get involved and you want to do a little bit of – work with us for us that'll get you in the door to I guess reap some of the benefits that are going to come along with um, having a brand with the Brooklyn Nets which 
Like the Brooklyn Nets have Katie and Kyrie. If anybody forgot, they're going to be a top team in the NBA. Come, come along, come along. The bandwagon is filling up. We're looking for people. Honestly, talking Nets is literally just Hudson and I, and we know to grow, we have to expand. So if you're listening to this pod and you're like, oh, I rock with these guys. I'm a huge Nets fan. I want to get involved when the world goes back to letting people into stadiums and stuff like that send us a message we'll reach out to you and if you're real about it if you show us right away that you're serious about it you'll be on board so what else it's we got a, it's a it's a commitment but let me tell you it's it's rewarding it's a lot of fun that's that's obviously how i got my start we touched on it earlier just helping out with the social media but you know as we grow it's it, it's tough for us to to you know be able to you know do all of the stuff online do the podcast and to be completely abreast with what's happening with the encore product and that's what we're going to talk about now not just the nets encore product but we have some other some big nba news some big you know big talk next season there's been a lot of talk about who's coming out of the east who's coming out of the west and one of the main storylines is can we see a nets warriors finals and, you know, that brings up the question for me. And I, Keith, I want to hear what you have to say about this. What do you think the Warriors should do with the number two pick? What do you think they should do in general, you know, to get that Nets Warriors, that KD versus his old team rematch? I mean, I think they got to go with a big, but who knows? They might trade that pick. For a while, people were saying Wiseman, but Wiseman could go one or uh, the kid out of Georgia could go one. I damn sure don't think they're going to get LaMelo Ball. I think that team, as currently constructed, could use a, a young big man with fresh legs that they can mold and bring along. Uh, obviously, Steph is going to be back. Clay, they got Clay. I saw Clay running sprints, and he looks healthy. Draymond is, is I'm sure, preparing to come back. Take a big, take a, take a big man. I, I know this draft is unorthodox. This is going to be a different kind of draft coming up, but we'll see what the Warriors do. I think it doesn't matter who they take. Like. I don't know if they're going to take someone that's going to come in and make an immediate impact. And even if it, if someone, they did take someone that could make an immediate impact, they've got impact players already. They absolutely do. And honestly, I put this question in the notes for one reason and one reason only. I needed a platform to talk about Eric Paschal, first team all NBA rookie, great player out of Villanova. But can I tell you, he didn't start out of Villanova. He started out of Fordham University. He was a Fordham Ram for mm. one season. And I can talk about this for an hour. I will literally, I will channel my inner Stephen A and start <laughs> calling blasphemy on all this. My man was a Fordham Ram for a season. And then we fired our head coach after he was named A-10 Rookie of the Year. And can I tell you something? The A-10 is a great conference. It may not be a power five, but it is a great conference. Oh, where did Obi Toppin come out of? The, the A-10. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff to talk about there. We fire our coach. Fordham is now the singular saddest basketball organization I've ever seen. It makes me <laughs> absolutely so – it's just so tragic every time I watch them play. And I do, and I support them, and I root for them all day, every day of the week. They're putting up flyers for walk-on tryouts in the freshman dorms. They're putting them everywhere. You can't, you can't walk five feet for, to, to not see a walk-on tryout flyer. They don't Man. do that – for football teams in the D1 and football teams in college can carry like 75 people and like a bunch <laughs> of walk-ons. This is a basketball team. You can only carry like 17 people in total. And you're putting out flyers for anyone to come try out and 2020, play. 2020, <laughs> my dude, my dog, Eric Paschal, you're an amazing player. Hopefully you can reconnect with those Fordham roots sometime. Hopefully you can do some good work on the Warriors, bring them back to some to some relevancy to some championship type energy i would love to see a nets warriors finals i think that would be <laughs> the most fun game we would see scores of like 140 to 135 no defense being played there at all that would be a lot of fun but we got some other things to talk about when it comes to that team because we had our guy our point guard a topic of a lot of trade rumors actually Spencer Dinwiddie come out and say he wants to be, you know, the Draymond Green, the glue of this Brooklyn Nets team. And when I first saw that quote, I was like, whoa, well, first off, you ain't Draymond Green. You're not that big. You can't do that. But then I read what he was trying to say, and I was like, okay, okay. So, Keith, what do you think about, 
you know, him trying to come out and be that glue for this team. I think Spence just got it like chill, bro. Like <laughs> say less. Um, like, I don't know. I don't think this type of stuff helps your cause. Um, I think you got to realize like there's been a shift here in this Brooklyn Nets organization. It's not the same organization it was when you were six man of the year. It's not the same organization it was when you were looking like the MVP all-star in the beginning of the year last year. I understand where he was coming from with that. I don't think anybody wants to be like Draymond Green, but we are going to need a glue guy. We are going to need a guy off the bench. Uh, I really hope Spencer stays because we do know what he's capable of. And like, if Katie has an off night, if Kyrie's hurt or vice versa, Kyrie has an off night, Katie's hurt, and we're looking for someone to give us 25, 30 points. Spencer's there. Obviously, we expect that out of Karras, but we, we know Spencer can do it. Spencer, Spencer's good for 25, depending on how many minutes you give him. So I don't know where he was going with this. I don't think it necessarily helps his cause. I, I just kind of want him to stay quiet so that he doesn't ruffle any, feather, any feathers and he doesn't get included in a trade. There's still plenty of time for him to get traded or moved or something to happen. So, Spencer. People, people got to know that having a spot on this team is not a guarantee if you were on the team last year. A lot of trade rumors, a lot of things flying around. And that brings us back to our guy, Kenny, who came out and he talked about, you know, his last real developmental success with the Nets before he was fired. Timote Luawu Cabarro, who, you know, he came out and he said, you know, he played, he, he's great. He's got a great future in this league. He's going to be a, a top player in this league for a long time. Obviously, we saw him average something like 15 points on 40% three-point shooting while like playing the five sometimes and not even getting into foul trouble in the bubble. That was a lot of fun to watch. And he's got himself locked down on a contract on, you know, through next season for like $1.25 million, not a lot of money. And it brings into light someone else on this team who, who might not come back because he's got a team option for $5 million. And that's, you know, the prez Garrett Temple, the old, the other old glue on this team, do you think that TLC being, you know, so cheap and so good with so much promise brings Garrett Temple's spot on this team into question? I think it could. And I, I think his spot is in question anyway. Uh, I think he is part of that, like, uh, like core friendship or like one of the guys that Kyrie and KD have rapport with. Like when he came in last year, I was like, Garrett Temple. And I think I heard somewhere that's like, yeah, uh, DeAndre Jordan, Garrett Temple, those are signings that like, you know, are good for Katie and Kyrie. But man, give me TLC over Garrett Temple. Not to, not to rag on GT. He had his moments. He had times where, like I was saying, you know, he's the calming agent of this team. When they start to panic, he's a veteran leader. And he was great for us in stretches and in different uh, spots. But man, just compare them in age. Compare them in price. Give me TLC all day. Absolutely. Obviously, we love TLC. We saw what the effect good coaching could have on TLC, especially, especially in the bubble. But as it turns out, some coaching news we talked about last week is not necessarily going to come to fruition. Phil Handy, he came out, he said, I'm going to stay with the Lakers. I'm going to stay with LeBron. I'm going to stay with AD. I'm going to stay with these boys out in La La Land. And to me, this feels like the kind of move that's like, all right, we didn't get one guy, we'll get another. Obviously, there's so many other great assistants that we can bring in. This is going to be kind of an assistant-centric coaching staff, considering we got, you know, our players guy at the helm, but we've got other more X's and O's, more detail-oriented guys that kind of are throughout the, the coaching staff and the organization. So I don't see it as too big of a loss. Keith, I know you're, you're a big LeBron guy, so, you know, you might see it as a big loss, but what do you think? What do you think about losing Phil nah. Handy? I didn't see it as a big loss or, or that much of a gain. I thought it would have been cool. You know, he was out there in L.A. I heard the players were out there in L.A. I guess was Phil Handy. The, the question I had last week was, wasn't Phil Handy in the bubble? Because uh, I think I read somewhere that, like, all the players are working out in L.A. And, like, they connected with Phil Handy. And I'm like, how would they connect with Phil Handy if he's in Orlando? But either way, um, good for him. If any, anyone in the Lakers organization should be trying to stay, anyone that's – coaching or playing for the Lakers should be trying to run it back. And they're going to, that team's going to change. Uh, Rondo might not be there. Dwight Howard might not be there. Like that team's definitely going to change. And uh, 
mean, they're talking about possibly signing Derrick Rose. So we'll see. Like you said in the beginning of the pod, and I said last pod, we are in the NBA fall, which is essentially the NBA summer. It's coming. Things are about to happen. Things are going to start changing. One more thing with Kenny. It sucks how everything went down with Kenny this year because we damn sure could use him as an assistant coach. He's done so much for these guys. We're talking about TLC, uh, Karis, Joe Harris, Spencer. All of these guys are Kenny guys, and he would be great for this team. Uh, it sucks that he never got to coach the superstars. He did all that grinding with us for about four years, and we get to the point where we land the superstars, and Kenny's not even going to get a chance to coach them. And because of the way everything shook out, he's not even going to get a chance to be on the bench. At least Jacques Vaughn gets to stay with the team and be on the bench as a, a high-paid assistant coach, which is good. But, yeah, I feel bad for Kenny. I said, oh, my God, they killed Kenny. They killed his career. He'll land somewhere. He'll be fine. He'll be that's fine. tough, but that's, that's life in the NBA. There's only 30 head coaching jobs, and most of them are filled. Yep. So we'll see what happens. Maybe next week we'll come back and we'll talk about how maybe Kenny's back on the Nets staff. Who knows? <laughs> but I think, I think that's a good place for us to stop it. That's a great episode, a great anniversary episode, nearly our first year doing this, 60 episodes in. You can look forward to at least and definitely more than 60 episodes going into next year. And man, Keith, that's all I got for this week. What do you have left to say? Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I, I'm deep in thought a lot lately. Like, we're, we're wrapping up the 2020 baseball season at John Boy Media. We're pushing hard, uh, you know, getting people to watch the live streams and creating content around baseball. And it, and it hurts because we're all Yankee fans, and we wanted to see the Yankees get, get there. And I mean, I know for me, when the Yankees lost the way they lost this year, I was like, man, fuck everything. Like, I need a break from everything. But, you know, everything changes and recalibrates. And, uh, you know, it, it's been a, a rough year. It's been a weird year, a strange year at times. It's, it's been a year at times where I'm like, does any of this shit matter? I had a, a quick conversation with my fiance the other night where I was like, yo, I'm a grown man who watches games that don't e exist as anything but a game. Like, they're, they don't matter. And there's stuff going on in Nigeria. And there's stuff going on right here. And, like, bigger things going on in the world. But I'm so consumed by a baseball game, a basketball game, a baseball team, a basketball team, other grown men playing a sport. And what my job is, is to cover those sports from the fan perspective and make cool gifts and memes and videos and podcasts. I'm like, is what I'm doing worth doing any? Like, I don't know. I, I, I get in those, uh, I get a little bit too deep in my head and I get in those spirals where I'm like, does any of this even matter? The world is burning. And like, where did we get through this 2020 year? But at the end of the day, I always come back around to this is what I love. There's a lot of people that love the same thing. And yes, this year I decide to use my platform for other things, but I do have a job and I do have a duty to keep creating and keep making and keep putting out content and putting out dope stuff for other people that like this stuff. And I will keep doing that hopefully forever. I'm blessed to have this opportunity. I'm blessed to have this podcast. And uh, we're going to keep it going. We want more of you to join us. We want more people on Talking Nets. Because when the NBA season starts, baseball will be, I don't know, coming out of hot stove talks. Like, I'm telling you guys, 2021, as soon as the ball drops, we're on to the Brooklyn Nets, KD and Kyrie era. If you're a Nets fan for the last five years, 10 years, 50 years, this is what you've been waiting on. And that is the focus get with us, reach out. It's our time. That's what I always say. Next season is the Nets season, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to covering it. I'm looking forward to getting into the Barclays Center, to being out and about in Brooklyn with the fans, with talking to people, and with people maybe even coming in, helping us out with some things. I'm looking forward to all of it. But we can't keep growing. We can't keep building without those ratings and those reviews. They're the lifeblood of everything that goes on here. I know I check it before every episode. Sometimes I check it every day if I need my ego boosted or, or taken down a notch. Who knows? But it, they're, they're what keeps this, the brand growing. They're what keeps everything growing. Keith always talks about how you know he'll hook you up if you leave us a review and you send us a DM. That's not an empty offer. We've done that a couple yeah. of times. 
So just leave a review. Let us know what you're thinking, what you want us to improve. Know that me and Keith, we're always working behind the scenes, always working to get things done, whether it's bringing new guests on, whether it's making movements for next season, whether it's you know new segments, new things to talk about in the podcast. We're always working. We're always growing for you guys. But if you guys want to be involved in it, you can be. Keith said you can come on, you know, help us out with some social media stuff, but you want a first step. People always say, hey, we, I want to get on the pod. I want to get involved in the pod. They're always DMing me. They're always DMing Keith. They're always you know, sending us texts about it. Leave a voicemail. That's what it's there for. Get involved in the conversation. Get your voice heard on the podcast. You can't be like, yo, I want to come on the podcast and not take your opportunity to get onto the podcast. So what you got to do, you got to call us, leave a voicemail at 201-870-0461. That's 201-870-0461. We will give you all the shout out, leave your, your ad, leave your handle, leave it, whatever you want on the end of it and say what you got to say, whether it's just saying what's up to us, you know, saying that you think that the Nets should trade KD and Kyrie for Giannis. I don't care. Say whatever, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to do to get involved with the podcast, to get involved in the conversation. But man, that's it, Keith. I think that's all we got. I'll let you sign off the same way you always do. Yep. You know it. We're getting closer. We're building, we're growing. And every day and every week that you hear this pod and as time passes and we go through the seasons and Halloween and November, Thanksgiving and Christmas and then New Year's and then Martin Luther King Day. And then, wow, things have changed. We get back to the games, back in Brooklyn, in the Barclays Center saying, let's go Nets, Brooklyn.